have you ever believed something that you found out later to be untrue? Like, I think we all have, right? Like, like think back to something that you, you believe, that you thought was true, that somebody told you, and you said, yeah, that's it. Like, I know that's true, only to find out later that it isn't. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, my mom used to tell me, can't go swimming until at least 30 minutes after you eat. Anybody else hear that one? Right? You can't swim until at least 30 minutes after you eat. Why? Because you'll get a cramp. You'll get a cramp and, you know, you're not that good of a swimmer anyway. So you'll get a cramp and, and you might drown. So I believed this. I would eat. I would not get in the pool for 30 minutes. You know what it, it turns out? Total wives' tale. Not true at all. Not true at all. Duke University did a study, and they found that when you eat, yes, blood does rush to your stomach, but not enough to give you a cramp. I think about how many cannonballs did I miss out on? <laughs> Thanks, Mom. You watching? Thanks, Mom. Seriously. Or, or how about this one? Don't swallow your gum, right? You guys know this one? Don't swallow your gum. If you swallow your gum, it's going to sit in your stomach for how long? Seven years, right? I'm pretty sure I told my daughter that last week, like... Make sure, don't you swallow that gum. Uh, Turns out, Mayo Clinic did a study, not true. Gum, this is gross, gum goes out the same way it goes in. But it doesn't sit in your stomach. So that's good news. So bubblicious, I'm coming for you later on today. Or or, or this one, don't go outside if your hair is what? Wet, right? I like to pretend this is how I look in the shower, by the way. (laughs) Don't go outside If your hair is wet, why? Because you'll get sick. Yeah, you're going to get a cold. Well, I think the last two years have taught us that colds come not from wet hair, but from viruses. And so this one isn't true either. And I'm just thinking, did anything from my childhood, was any of it real? I believe so many things. Uh, Finally, the last one that really sticks with me is, if you shave, it'll grow back what? Thicker, right? So, so, you know, to little kids, don't start shaving too early, right? It's going to grow back thicker. Well, I'll tell you, I've been shaving every other day for a long time, and it doesn't grow back thicker. I'll just let you know, that is a reality. See, we all have things in life, right, that we believe, that we believe to be true, that we find out later they aren't. And most of the time, it's harmless, right? It's bubble gum, it's swimming after you eat, it's these kind of things. But there are times in life when it's not. There are times in life when we begin to believe something to be true, and it impacts the way we live, it impacts our relationships, and there are even those situations that end up wrecking your life. Because I think sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we begin to believe that the only way for me to get ahead is to cheat. The only way for me to, to, to get that promotion at work is to, to cut a corner. The only way for me to get that sale that's going to set my family apart is to, you know, just overlook a few things. I think there are those views that, that we fall into in life where we say, well, the uh, only way for me to, to really feel loved is to, is to, to date that, that person. And I, I know they're not the right one for me, but they're really the only one available. It's just the only way I'm going to feel loved. Or or for for someone who says, you know, life just seems really kind of dull and and dry and boring, and I think I just need a, I just think I need a fling. You know, I just think I need a a quick office office romance, and that's just going to, it's going to solve my problem. But in all of those cases, what ends up happening is what you think could be something that's harmless, it ends up potentially wrecking your life. And I guarantee you, none of you woke up this morning and said, hey, today's going to be the day. I'm going to wreck my life. It's going to be a great day. But we don't even think about it, but it sneaks up on us. These little things we think are harmless end up leading us down a path where we do not want to go, and we buy into these things. And some of us feel like we've been in that cycle over and over again, like it's a trap we keep falling into. So here's the question. What if I told you, is there a way out of this? What if I told you the Bible tells us that there is a way to get out of the cycle, to stay away from the trap, but to do so, it requires us making sure we listen to the right voices and begin to block out the wrong ones. In the book of Genesis, and ending in chapter 2, moving into chapter 3 this morning, we're going to see what happens when we listen to the wrong voices. We're going to have the example, the consummate example of what happens when we let the wrong voices in and we don't block them out. And how that, that ends up leading to a place where, where we, we make bad decisions that have consequences, that end up wrecking our life. And we're going to see Adam and Eve today, and, and the, the story in Genesis 3, wreck their life. And it leads to consequences, but not just in their own life. It leads to consequences in all of our lives. 
If you've been with us the past few weeks, we've been working our way through uh, the, the book of Genesis. And we started in Genesis chapter 1, and we saw that God creates everything, and he says he creates it good. He calls it good. He creates mankind, and he calls it good. We see in chapter 2 that God gives us the picture of the way the world was meant to be. We said it's like the box to the puzzle. This is the way the world is supposed to look. And we see God create Adam and God create Eve. And we see the first wedding and the first marriage. And it's this really beautiful picture. But yet, in Genesis 3, things change. But we're left with this picture at the end of Genesis 2.25. And, and here, here's what we, we read. It says at the end, they, they, Adam and Eve, they get married. It's this beautiful relationship. And it says that the man and the wife, his wife, were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, some of you are like, this is your favorite verse in the Bible, right? <laughs> this one, and Jesus turning water into wine, and then what Jesus said about not judging, and you're like, that's my theology, right? I'm, I'm all good right there. But there's so much more for us in chapter 3 that we're going to see today. All of a sudden, we go from this beautiful picture of total access, total vulnerability, you know, and this beautiful relationship, to within seven verses, completely unraveling. What happened? Adam and Eve let the wrong voices in. And it ended up leading to a place where we see humanity unravel. And we ask the question, why is the world so messy? We get the answer right here. So if you have your Bibles, look with me. Genesis chapter 3. And we're just going to camp out mainly in the first, in the first three verses. I'm sorry, the first seven verses. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Now, if you've been with us, you, you'll know that we've had God walking with Adam and Eve during chapter 2. And now in chapter 3, we're introduced to a new character, and it's the serpent. It's this talking snake. And so how do we make sense of that? You know, part of me wonders, did, did Eve and Adam just talk to animals? Is that what happened in the garden? Because Eve doesn't seem very surprised that there's this snake that's now talking to her. But, but I, don't, I don't think that's what's going on. I, I think when we look at what's going on here, we see Adam and Eve, and they're, they're living in the Garden of Eden, walking with God. And we see that the Garden of Eden is an amazing place. It's a special place. Think of it like the intersection between the spiritual and the physical. And, and so Adam and Eve are living in this, in this garden, and they're walking with God, and they're in God's presence, and they're walking in unison with God. And so when, I think when Eve sees this serpent start speaking to her, she assumes it's a spiritual being because she's living in a spiritual place. She's living at the intersection of the spiritual and the physical. Now, now we find out later that the snake that she's talking to actually is Satan. The snake she's, she's talking to actually is, is this character that we're known in, in the Bible as the enemy and the deceiver and, and the accuser. And in Revelation chapter 12, we see him referred to as Satan, as the devil, and, and, and now we're seeing that the story unfolds. So we have to wonder, who is this guy? Like, who, who is this snake? Who is this character? Who is this voice? And we get a glimpse of this if you look at the books of Ezekiel and Isaiah. In Ezekiel 28 and in Isaiah 14, you get this picture that, that really back in the, in the beginning of time, in, in the heavenly realm, you get this picture that God is, creates the angels, and there is one angel named Lucifer who leads a, result, a revolt against God. There's a third of the angels revolt against God. They want to take power from God, and, and they lose. God wins. God always wins. They, they lose. God wins, and God casts them out. They get exiled out of heaven. And this angel, who's said to be the most handsome of all angels, his name was Lucifer. So God cast Lucifer and all of his fallen angels out. And they become known as the devil, the accuser. Lucifer is now known as Satan throughout the Bible. And the, the fallen angels are now what we know as the demons that we see all throughout the rest of the scripture. So this is the character that we're introduced here into Genesis chapter 3. Now I know what a lot of you are thinking. Some of you may be thinking. You get to Genesis 3, you say, ah, this is starting to feel like a comic book. Like, this is just starting to seem different. Like, this character, now we have a talking snake, and he, he's, he's the devil, and, like, what's really going on? You know, it is interesting. We live in a, in a world with a lot of opinions on spirituality. And we live in a world where there's a lot of spiritual things going on. I mean, you, you can read about the occults, and you can read about witchcraft, 
And, and you can read about vortexes in Sedona, and you can read about, about um, crystals, and you can read about all these different things. But then there's a whole popula- segment of the population that says, ah, spiritual stuff's just not real. It's just made up. It's just a feel-good story, or it's just a scare tactic. But do you want to know who talks the most about the, the, the spiritual forces in the world? It's Jesus. See, Jesus has a lot to say about the spiritual forces, and and the Bible has a lot to say about dark spiritual things. I want to just show you one verse. I just want to show you one verse in 1 Peter 5.8. Notice what Peter says about this character we're introduced to today. Peter says this. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. When we think of the devil, what do we think about? Pitchfork, right? Red dude, horns, pitchfork. Creepy laugh, right? That's the guy we think of. Notice how Peter refers to the devil as a roaring what? As a lion. And notice what that roaring lion is doing. He's seeking to what? Like come alongside and, and make you laugh, or tickle you. I mean, no, devour you. And so he says, be sober-minded. Be watchful because the, 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 the devil, your adversary, your enemy, he's not just going to knock on your door to tell you he's there. He's not going to send you a text so you know, hey, watch out, I'm on my way. He's going to sneak up on you, and he wants to do it because he wants to devour you. He wants to to take advantage of you. And a lot of us, we say, eh, whatever. Eh, It doesn't matter to me. I don't know. I'm not really sure how I feel about this character. But it always comes in a disguise. And so for you and I, we we might look at this and say, well, how how does does this character work in our world now? And could it be similar to what we read in Genesis 3? For sure. It could be coming in the form of bad advice or media or social media or or a song or or something in a movie or whatever. In this case, in Genesis chapter 3, we see that that, that, that the enemy uses a snake. Now, it's kind of weird, right? Like, why wouldn't he just come himself? Like, why would he come as a snake? Like, what's that all about? Why a snake? Well, there's a lot to be said, so tune in to the podcast on Tuesday. So I've got to give you that teaser every week. But there's a lot of opinions about this snake. Why did he come as a snake? And, and one of the opinions is this, that, that angels and demons are spiritual beings, not physical. So you couldn't see the enemy. He had to take the form of something. Another opinion is it's just an allegory for evil. It's an allegory for the evil that, is, that exists. But I don't think that's it, because as of Genesis 2, there was no sin in the world yet. Adam and Eve had not yet sinned, so evil Evil wouldn't have existed in Eve to have made that decision. There's, there's another opinion out there that, that, that he was actually, invi- you know, he's actually a spiritual being, but the, Eve saw a snake and he whispered in her ear and she thought she was talking to the snake. She was kind of in this illusion. But I don't think that's it either. I think we need, we talk about this all the time, we need to learn to read the Bible in context. And what we see in context is that there's a discussion going on. That Eve is actually having a discussion with this serpent, with this talking snake and, and, and we believe that, that this is a historical, factual, accurate event. So I think the most plausible explanation is that the, the devil has taken and possessed the snake. That he has actually possessed the snake and now is using that snake to, to speak to Eve. We see Jesus cast a demon out in the book of Mark into a herd of pigs that go down the hillside into the water. We see that, that in, in the Bible that spiritual beings can, take, can, can possess animals. And I think that's what's going on here. So it's actually... Satan, the enemy, the devil, who has possessed a snake. It's really weird, but this is what we've got. This is what God is telling us. And so now we see that there's this discussion with Eve that, that begins, and, and I want you to just notice something, though. Don't miss this. In Genesis 3, verse 1, it says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than the other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Notice that word crafty. Anybody here into crafting? I see a couple hands. Some of y'all are like, me. Crafting, right? What, what is crafting? Well, you know, I, for those of you guys that love crafting, I'm going to tread lightly, right? But I think of crafting and you're selling something and I'm buying something, right? And typically it's an old piece of barn wood that you got somewhere that looks really cool and you, you wrote faith, hope, and love on it and I paid $35 for it and it's hanging on the wall in my living room. And it's a beautiful thing, but you are selling something and I am buying for it. I am buying it. The devil is trying to sell us something. He's trying to sell us junk and cause us to buy it. He is crafty. He is cunning, some of your Bible translations may say. And notice what he's doing. He's trying to sell Eve some junk. Look here back at verse 1. He says to Eve, he says to the woman, did God actually say? Like, hey, hey Eve, out of all the things that God said, did God actually say that you shall not eat of any of the trees in the garden? 
Now, I want you to notice something. A few weeks ago, we talked about how to read the Bible for all it's worth. And we talked about learning to decipher God's name in the pages of the Bible. So I've got a slide just to, to, to make some sense of this. We talked about when we see God's names, we can often find them in the way that God's name is written in the Bible. So if we talk about Genesis chapter 1, we see God is Elohim. We see the name God. We get to Genesis chapter 2, we start to see the name Lord God. And Lord is in all capitals, cap, big capital L, little capital O-R-D. And it means Yahweh. So, so Elohim is God's proper name. It's, 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 it's God's uh, generic name. And, and Yahweh is God's personal name, his covenant name. And so I want you to notice what happens here. In verse 1, he says uh, to the woman, did God actually say? So what, what the enemy does is he changes God's name. He changes God's name back to God. Instead of saying, did, did, did the Lord God say, your, say this to you? He said, no, did God say this to you? See, I, I have two names. And, and Emma, my daughter, she's in here with us today. If, if, I, I have two names. I have Drew and I have Daddy, right? Now, does Emma call me Drew sometimes? She does. And usually there's a reason, right? And why is that reason? Because she wants to take a little slight, right? There's a little bit of disrespect I know she's just having fun with it, but there's just a little bit of a slight when your kids call you by your first name. Well, Drew, let me tell you what I think about that. Notice this is what the enemy is doing right here to Eve. He doesn't say, hey, your, your, your heavenly father, God, Yahweh. He says, hey, does that, did that just kind of generic did that just distant deity, did that God that just kind of set you here and left you here, did he really, I mean, did he really say you can't eat of any fruit of the garden? Like, did he really say you couldn't eat fruit from any tree? Do you notice the deception here? Notice what he's doing? He's trying to get in there. He's trying to, he's trying to take away and say, and say that, that God, you think that your heavenly father, they think that you're walking with, you think that you have a personal relationship with, he really doesn't. He really doesn't care about you. He really doesn't love you. He really isn't here for you. And so he's beginning to, to start this, this planting the seed of doubt. And well, here's what he wants Eve to see. He wants Eve to believe that God said something different than he really said. Because he wants to get Eve's attention. And he wants to get Eve to a place where she begins to think, wait, hold on a second. Maybe God really is holding something back from me. Maybe God really isn't giving me all the details. Maybe God really is out of step with what I need in my life. See, I, I think if we're, we're honest, that sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Like, where do you think the concept that, that our culture gets that God's out of step? Like, where do you think the con concept that our culture gets that, you know, God's just behind the times? Where does that come from? Right here. It comes from the enemy trying to plant a seed of doubt. See, we start to say, ah, oh, God, how restrictive. Yeah, God, how do I out of touch? I mean, God... Really? Like, you really think that? Like, God, how can I live that way? Like, God, like, you really want me to believe that, that sex is only okay inside of a marriage between a man and a woman? Like, God, you really want me to believe that I can't pursue a bank account with my full heart and I can't pursue you with, with my full heart? God, you really want me to believe that first is last and last is first? I mean, come on. Like, you're so... Behind the times. That doesn't even make sense. And I think this is, what, this is what he wants. The enemy wants you to doubt God's word just enough. Just enough. Plant that seed out just enough to cause you to start to evaluate God's goodness. And here's why this is, this is his tactic. And here's why this is so dangerous. Because when you begin to start to evaluate God's goodness, you put yourself on the throne and God is held accountable to you. And that's dangerous. Because if you start holding God accountable to you, then you start processing God through your filter of what is right and wrong and your filter of what is good and bad rather than trusting what God has to say. And when we begin to sit on the throne of judgment on God's goodness, it always will hijack our perspective. See, notice what God is doing. No, notice this. God, or the devil plants, notice what the devil is doing. He plants this seed of doubt. Did God actually say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? No, he didn't say that. Go back to Genesis 2. If you have, if, 2. have your Bibles, flip back one page or maybe just look up like half the page. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Notice what God says. He says to them, and the Lord God commanded to, to Adam at the time, you may surely eat of any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge 
of good and evil you shall not eat. For if you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. How many trees did God say you can't eat of? One. How many trees did he say you could eat of? I mean, thousands? Tons, right? Any tree in the garden. And God told us in chapter 2 that God made the garden plentiful of beautiful trees full of fruit and that were beautiful to look at. And so we see that, that, that what, what, what Satan's doing is he's trying to cast doubt on what God says. He's trying to get Eve to sit in judgment on God's goodness. And he's taking the focus of all the things that Eve can have and pointing to the one thing she can't. See, this is his tactic. If I told you right now, do not look at my shoes, what are you going to do? Look at my shoes. Thankfully, I wore good shoes today. But, I mean, seriously, I say, don't look at my shoes. You're going to look at my shoes. Why? Because that's what we're naturally drawn to. You know, if you have kids, you know this. You tell them not to do something, what are they going to do? They're going to do that one thing, testing the boundaries. I mean, that's, that's something that, that, that the enemy that's grabbing a hold of. And so he, he knows that. He's drawing Eve's attention to the one thing she cannot have. And see, so here's the reality. God has given you so many things. God has given me so many things. God has given us so many blessings. God has given Adam and Eve thousands of trees, delicious fruits, whatever they wanted to eat. But he draws their attention to the one thing she can't have. Why did God tell her that? Why did God tell Adam and Eve that? They couldn't have this one tree. It was for their protection. See, God said you can have all of these things. But here's the one thing you don't want because it's bad for you. So God wants to protect us. My family, we live um, on, a, on a fairly busy street. It's kind of a, a cross street where people cut through to avoid, to avoid traffic. And um, one of the reasons we bought the house, though, is because we love the backyard. It was a, a great backyard where the kids could play. But around the backyard is a fence. And that fence is to protect my kids from playing in the backyard. And when they're in the backyard, there's really not really any rules, right? Do whatever you want. Stay inside the fence. Just no knives right? No knives and no face shots, no punching above the neck, right? Everything else pretty much goes. Now, is that fence there to restrict their freedom? No, that fence is there to protect them because they don't want to get them out and get them in the road where they could get hurt. This is what God does to us. God does give us some protections that we need to pay attention to, but they're not to restrict us because we've got this just the divine killjoy in God who doesn't want us to have any fun. They're meant to protect us from the, the danger they can cause. You know, I love how Matt Chandler says, he says, all the shalls and shall nots of the Bible are meant for your flourishing. So when God tells you to do something or not to do something, it's not meant to hold you back. It's not meant to keep you from experiencing life and the joys of life. It's meant to keep you from wrecking your life. But what the devil does is he points to that one thing, that one thing, and he says, look, isn't God so strict? Isn't God just trying to keep you from living your best life now? You know, if you remove the restrictions that God has put in front of you, you will be happy. Make the decisions as you want to make them. The freedom that you want comes from jumping over the fence. And so now he's setting the trap for Eve. And notice that Eve takes the bait. Look at her, verse 2. Notice what she says. And she says this. And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, the, the, the knowledge of, of good and evil, and neither shall you touch it, lest you'll die. Notice what happened. He planted that seed of doubt, and now she's in her mind thinking, yeah, you're right, God is pretty strict. God's not going to let me eat that fruit. Actually, I can't even touch the thing. And God's kind of grouchy, actually. He hadn't had his espresso yet, so I wouldn't talk to him. He's just, he's a little uptight. Like, notice how quick that shifted? It, it shifted to this point where now she's adding to the word of God. See, the enemy twists words. Notice this. The enemy twists words, twists God's words, so you'll become discontent with what God has given you. See, now she's not focused on all of the stuff she can have. She's focused on the one tree she can't have, and now she can't even go touch that thing. I don't know about you guys, but if you have kids or if you have teenagers, this is probably really true. You ever noticed when, when your kids walk into the kitchen, or maybe you got somebody, you know, your nephew, niece, grandkid walks in the kitchen, and they open up the fridge, you ever notice how they always react? You know, it, it's funny. My kids will go into the fridge, and like we could just go into the store, right? We got the thing stocked, and they'll open the door. You know and what they don't say? Father, thank you for the bounty in front of me. <laughs> Choice fruits and vegetables, 
beautiful, fresh squeezed juices and delicious meat. Oh my goodness, Dad, I can't, I'm gonna be here for a week. This is amazing. Now, what do they do? Ah, there's nothing in there to eat. I'm like, there's a whole fridge. No, I'm starving to death. I'm going to die. Literally, I'm going to die. There's nothing for me to eat. We do that too, don't we? Like how often has God just blessed us with a great group of friends or a great job? God's blessed us with a house with a roof over our head. It's not leaking water when we get the weekly eight inches that we've been getting. Like, we get all these blessings. God has given us a, a Savior to walk side by side, to pick us up when we fall down and forgive us when we mess up, which, if you're like me, is all the time. And what do we do? God's given us this fridge full of all these beautiful things, and we're like, yeah, it's just not enough. I mean, thanks, God. It's kind of cool. It's just, I was kind of hoping for more. We, follow ourselves, we find ourselves in this trap all the time. And see, I want you to notice that what Satan gives to Eve, he does, Satan doesn't deny God exists. Satan doesn't even deny God's commands. But what he does is he, shadow, he gives her a shadow of doubt. He starts to twist God's word. Why? Because he wants to set up the lie. Notice the lie. Verse 5. But then the serpent said to the woman, well, you, you're not going to surely die. Like, I know God said that, but you, really, you think that? You really believe him? Like, you're not going to die. And here's why. For God knows that when you eat of that fruit, that your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. See, notice the lie. Did you, did you catch it? The lie that, God is, that, that, that the devil is saying is that God just doesn't want you to be like him. Like, God doesn't want to give you the, the freedom to do that because then you're going to be like him. He doesn't want you to experience that happiness and that joy and that fullness. God doesn't want you to be like him because then you're going to know right from wrong. And then you're going to know good from bad. And then you're going to be free and God's not going to be able to keep you in your little box anymore. See, this is the lie that Satan is trying to get it. He wants you to say, look, when you do this, there's no consequences. You will be your own God and you will get to determine what's right and wrong for you. And we see that in our culture all the time. Oh, man. You don't need someone else telling you how to live. Make your own choices. Do what's right for you. You don't need somebody else telling you what to do with your body. You get to choose what's right or wrong. You don't get to make your own choice on who you have relationships with or who you sleep with or who you get in business with. Why would, you, why would somebody get to tell you what to do? You don't get to have somebody else tell you what to do with your money or tell you how to, to live your life. And Satan is saying, God is telling you a lie, and can you really believe a God like that? And so we set up the lie. And I think we look around our culture, and we see this all the time. And we find ourselves in a place where you'll hear people say, well, I can't believe in a God like that, fill in the blank. And ultimately, I think it comes down to this reality that, that we really don't know what God has said. But we say that because we took somebody else's word for it. We had the wrong voice in our life tell us something, and we didn't investigate it on our own, and now we're saying, well, I can't believe in a God if he's like that. Well, do we really know what God said? That's why God wants us to listen to the right voices and block out the wrong ones. It's like walking into the doctor, and you've got a terrible stomach ache, and the doctor's like, hey, I want to let you know you've got ulcers, and they're really bad. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to, to change your diet, and I want you to take these, med these medications for the next 90 days. And for you to be like, nah, can't do it. I like hot sauce way too much, and those jalapeno tamales ain't going to eat themselves, right? Like, how often do we do that in life? It's crazy it is. We're always saying, I got this. I, I, yeah. you, might have a, you might have an MD at your name, but I know what's best. God, you might be the creator of the world, but I got it. Don't worry. I know what's best. We fall into this trap all the time, and the reason is, because of Genesis 3. Because there is something, let's be honest, this is a place to be real. There is something deeply fractured inside of us. Something deeply fractured that ends up turning everything all about me. It, it, it's all about me. Just think like this. When, when, when somebody takes a picture of you and they show you that picture, who's the first person you look at? You. It doesn't matter if your kid has mustard all over their face, their finger in their nose. If you look good, what are you doing? Post it, right? Instagram, quick, right? Get it up. 
Like, it's all about us, who we are. So have you ever had somebody like share on Facebook a picture of like your old, like maybe from high school or, or a work party, and it's like a huge group of people? What do you do? You start zooming in, right? You're trying to find yourself. You're like zooming in the back row. You're like, oh, I know a little, you know, Joe's over there. I'm probably in the back. You're trying to find yourself. Why do we do that? Because we are completely focused on us. I'm completely focused on myself. And why, do, why is that? Because of this lie right here in Genesis chapter 3. It becomes all about my happiness level and all about what I will find to be fulfilling. We all want to be king, but here's the problem. We are terrible kings. Let's be honest. Like, we are terrible kings. We can't even treat ourselves right. How are we going to treat somebody else right? And so we need somebody to set us straight, and God gives us his word, and God gives us his shalls and shall nots to help give us what is best for our lives. But we fall into this thinking that I should be able to choose what's best. And so what Satan does, he gives us this lie. The enemy wants you to believe the lie that God's way can never be the right way. Did God really say, you're not going to surely die because then you'll be like God if you actually follow your heart. And so Satan's saying, you'll never be happy if you are confined to God's rules. You'll never be happy until you follow your own life. You'll never be happy until you do things the way that you want to do. And Satan's great lie is that happiness exists apart from God. And this is what we see he's with Eve. The happiness is apart from God. Now, now let me just be real for a second. Your desire for happiness your desire for, for joy and, and for, for peace and, and for love and for all these things, those are good things. Those are God-given desires. But the problem is the foolishness exists when we begin to think that those things are available apart from God. We become foolish when we begin to think that, that I can make the choice to know what is truly is right for me, better than the one that made me, better than the one that spoke the world into existence. And when we choose that, it wrecks us. I was reading an article this week about the online dating app, Tinder. Now, you guys have probably heard about Tinder. Maybe some of you have been on Tinder. Maybe some of you have met on Tinder, and that's great if you have. But I was reading some of the statistics of the Tinder users, and this really jumped out to me. It might be hard to see this graph. But it said out of the Tinder users that 30% of people on the app are married and that 12% of people on the app are in a relationship already. That means that 42%... Nearly half of everybody who's on the app is either dating somebody or married. What does that tell you? That the people who, uh, that this population of people, I'm sure there's a lot of great people on, in the other percentages, but this population of people are, are thinking that they're going to solve their, their loneliness or, or their boredom or, or their pain with a, with a fling, with, with a, with a one-night stand, with an affair. And that it's going to be harmless. But that's really what's going to make them feel alive. They bought into the, the lie that they are going to find happiness and joy by following their own desires and feelings. See, this is what the enemy wants Eve to believe. And this is what he wants us to believe. That sin has no consequences, so do what you want. But for, for, there's a harsh reality here. And this is one of the most depressing chapters in the Bible but there's a harsh reality here, guys, is that sin always has its consequences. In John 10, 10, Jesus says this. He says that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's the enemy. He wants to come in and make you believe that you can go and do whatever you want. It's not going to matter. There's no consequences. Go have fun. Follow your heart. And it's going to end up wrecking your life and stealing your happiness and stealing your joy. But instead, Jesus says, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. That the good life, the real life, the full life, the rich life, the deep life, the faith life comes from following Jesus because his plan for your life is the best plan. And so now we have this, this moment, right? It's, it's the moment we're all waiting for. The, 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 the devil has now caused Eve to doubt. He's now twisted God's word, and now he's lied, and he set the trap and what's Eve going to do? Now, in this moment, Eve could, if Eve was thinking, right, she would have had to stop and said, hold on a second. Hey, Adam, let's talk. Hey, God, let's, let's talk about this. Is, is what he's saying true? Let me, let me check. But he doesn't. Well, she doesn't. What does she do? She takes his word for it. She's talking to a snake, and she takes his word for it. Notice what happens in verse 6. So, so the woman saw the tree was good for food. 
and that it was a delight to her eyes. Remember the garden? Remember the, the word Eden means delight, right? So everything was delightful in the garden. So she saw it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. See, she bought the lie. Oh, I will be like God if I eat this fruit. This is what I need. This is what I need in my life. This is going to make me happy. So she took it at the fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate. Right here. This is the moment the world broke. Right there, that one act. You might go, that's just, there's eat, what is it, an apple, a mango, I mean, a pear? Like, it's not that big of a deal. But it was complete disobedience to God. They completely bought into the lie. And, and right there, the world cracked. Right there, the world fractured. It's like Siri on Witcher Season 2 when she screams, right? Just like the crack in the foundation. And everything changed at that moment. You see the snowball that happens all throughout history. See, she looked at the fruit. It looked good. She bought in the lie, she ate it, and it wrecked her life. And you can see how in verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened. Adam and Eve, all of a sudden, their eyes were opened. The Hebrew word for, for, for opened means that they saw their sin. Like they, they, they experienced shame. They experienced guilt. It's that feeling we get when we know that we, we thought something wasn't going to make us happy and make us feel good, and we did it, and all of a sudden we feel terrible. That feeling for the very first time in the history of the world, right there, Adam and Eve felt it. Notice what happened. So their eyes were opened, and they knew they were what? And they were naked, and so they went, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they went and hid. See, remember, we started in Genesis 2.25, and what did we find? That they were, there was no shame. They were living total access, total vulnerability, total peace, walking with God, and now all of a sudden, they feel shame, and they feel guilt. And they feel terrible. And they ran and they hid. Isn't that what we do too? Like if we're honest, like when sin hits, we run and hide. It's like when I hear it get really quiet downstairs where the kids are. And I'm like, something's up. I need to walk down. And I hear, hey, dad's coming. Hide the peanut butter and the scissors. <laughs> You're like, okay, something bad just happened. I think that's what we do, right? We, we sin, something happens to us, and all of a sudden, we, we feel the shame, we feel this guilt, we're going to go hide. And I'm going to put on this false front so people think I still got it together, even though I'm a complete disaster. And we go and we hide, and we go hide behind a bush, but really, hiding is never the answer. Hiding just makes it worse. And so here we are in this moment where Eve makes this decision. And I want you to notice, within the next few verses, it unravels quick. In the next few verses, Adam starts playing. God's like, where are you guys? Why are you hiding from me? And they're like, and of course, God knows where they are. And they're like, well, um, we, we realized we didn't have any clothes on, and we were, kind of, we were kind of embarrassed. And God's like, well, well, why? Did you do something you weren't supposed to do? Did you eat the tree I told you not to eat? And Adam's like, well, Eve gave it to me. And Eve's like, well, the snake gave it to me. And I think we realize we always want to blame somebody else for our decisions. In reality, somebody else can tempt you. The, de the devil can tempt you. Somebody can give you the piece of fruit, but it's your choice to eat it. And I want you to notice something, too. Adam was next to Eve the whole time. It's not like Adam told Eve, like, hey, God told us one time, don't eat that tree. And then Eve's off over here, and she doesn't know. Like, Adam's standing next to her the whole time. And what does Adam say during this entire discussion? Nada. Doesn't say anything. Instead, he's buying into the whole thing, and then Eve gives him the fruit, and he eats it too. What does, that even, what does that mean? I think there's some implication of that, fellas. Like, we need to run in when somebody's trying to deceive our ladies. Like, when, 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 when you get pulled out of the situation, and all of a sudden that you don't step in and defend God and your wife, things are going to unravel quick. So Adam just lets this happen. Not only has Adam and Eve's relationship been messed up and they're blaming each other, now their, their relationship with God is broken. They're walking in perfect harmony with God in the garden, but now that they've sinned, they can't stay in the garden anymore because it's a holy place, and so now they have to get kicked out of the garden. In a few, one chapter later, we see they have kids, and now the first murder happens. I mean, that escalated quickly, right? From an apple to a murder? <laughs> that thing went quick, but that's, that's life. We see the first murder. A couple of late, chapters later, one of their great-grandsons, Lamech, starts a polygamous camp. And then by G Genesis chapter 6, we see the whole world except for one dude named Noah is just completely rotten, completely wicked. And God has to do something to reset humanity. In three chapters, you see something as easy as deception lead to a global flood. And it shows you 
how quick sin can take over, how quick sin can spiral and take us to a place we don't want to go. And we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 3 now in a complete, utter disaster. A couple weeks ago, I asked the question, if God is so good, then why is the world such a mess? If God is so good, then why are things so broken? If God created the world so good and he created mankind so good, then why are things so fractured? And see, here's our answer. It took us a couple weeks to get there, but this is the answer. Genesis 3. This is the reason we have hurricanes and we have tornadoes and we have earthquakes. This is the reason that we have wars and we have battles and people are born with defects and this is the reason that people die of cancer and this is the reason that politicians can't get along and this is the reason that we have poverty and hate and greed and racism and all of these things. It all starts right here in Genesis chapter 3. It's like that scene if, you, if you've watched it in Trolls 2, right, when the music is gone and the color goes out. And it's just quiet. But I want you to notice something. While it seems like all the color is lost from the garden, there's, there's no hope, everything seems broken. I want you to see something. There's, there's a heartbeat. It's like the whisper of Aslan in a cold, cold winter in Narnia. There is a promise that God makes right here amongst the colorless backdrop in verse 15. Notice this. God is cursing the serpent, and here's what he says. I want you to see this, because if we miss it, it goes too fast, and uh, we, we really can't collect it. Here's what God says. He says to the serpent, he says to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, you can read that over and just like that, and you go right over it. But I want you to see, hidden in this text is God's promise to fix what was just broken. Hidden in this text is God's promise that one day Eve is going to have a great, 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 great grandson. And that great, 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 great grandson is going to come and fix what was broken. And the, the devil is going to strike his heel, but that he will crush the devil's head and forever mo- remove the the fate of sin and, and death over mankind. And for I want to tell you that that has happened. That happened. Do you know the night before Jesus was arrested, he walked back into the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. He walked back in the garden to take on the snake. Do you know that Jesus stepped out of heaven to the run to the aid of his bride when Adam couldn't even say a word to protect his? See, Jesus came here for us to fix what was broken. And when Jesus went to the cross, he paid the penalty for Adam and Eve's sin. He paid the penalty for your and my sin. And here's the beautiful part, for the past, present, and future sin. Jesus has paid it all. And he came so he could fix what was broken so long ago and make a way for us to have a future and have a life so we can redeem what was lost. And after he died, three days later, just what an amazing scene. His heart started beating again. His lungs started to breathe again. He kicked the stone out of the way and defeated death. And because of that, when we say yes to Jesus, when we put our faith in Jesus, we can have life. Because Jesus came and fixed all of those things that were broken that you and I can't fix. Because you and I continue to fall for the same deception and twisting and lie that the devil gave Eve. He gives to us and the world has bought in, but Jesus came to bring us out. And this means that if, if you've never said yes to Jesus, that shame and that guilt that we feel because of sin and that, 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 the, the reaching and the desire to try to find happiness our own that we can never get, It's only available when we trust in what Jesus did for us on the cross. When we say yes to Jesus, it changes everything because it means that we have been freed of our past and set to walk in the beautiful future and the fullness of life that God created us to walk in. This also means for someone else that has said yes to Jesus, but that just feels like they're falling in that trap of believing things they shouldn't believe and, and living these lies and dealing with the consequences of sin. If you've said yes to Jesus, this means that you're free from that. Like, you're free from the rule of that. Like, you can break free because sin no longer has power over you because of what Jesus did on the cross. And that is good news. 
That means that you can come home. That means you can step out of whatever that sin is that's holding you tight and give it to Jesus and say, Jesus, help me become the person you've created me to be. See, that's what we have in Jesus. That's the freedom that we have because Jesus has made the way for us. I want to invite the worship band back on stage, and I just want to tell a quick story, and then we'll finish. In 1862, if you're a Civil War buff, you may be familiar with some of this. In 1862, there was the Battle of Antietam. It was in Sharpsburg, Maryland, and it ended up being a battle that turned the war. What was happening was you had General Lee, who was for the Confederate Army, and he was marching his army against General McClellan for the North, for the Union Army. And General Lee was a brilliant strategist. General McClellan McClellan was an okay general. And the the Confederate Army had gained great steam, and and so I know that the Union Army was really worried about this battle. And this was going to be a pivotal battle for the end of the war. And so the night before the battle... The Confederate army packed up camp and moved out, and, and as the Union army came through, some scouts found a group of, a pack of three cigars on the, on the ground where their camp was. Wrapped around those cigars was the Confederate army battle plan. And so they found the battle plan. They took it back to, uh, to General McClellan, and they ended up winning the battle. And it turned out to be a terribly bloody battle, but the Union claimed victory. And eight days later, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation proclamation. They were going to be outnumbered. They were going to be out armed, but they won. How did they win? Because they had the battle plans. And that's a really good start. See, forefront, one of the things I think God wants us to see right here is that we have outlined in front of us the enemy's battle plans. And we know how he's going to try to come and change our lives and deceive us and twist God's word and cause us to to doubt and believe the lie. But we also have God's battle plan for how God is going to make all things right. And if you flip to the very back of the book, you'll be pleased to find out how it all turns out. The good guys win. The reality is, whether or not we say yes or no depends on what voice we're listening to. And Jesus came to redeem what was lost and to fix what was broken. And when we trust him and we trust in God's plan to lead us where God is taking us to go, we can walk in the path that God has laid before us. So this week, Forefront, the question we have to answer is, whose voice are we listening to? And I pray we learn to listen to the right one.